The Chinese military is one of the largest militaries on planet Earth. Spending an incredible $293 billion in 2021 on defense, they rank second in the world behind the United States. Coming in second here is impressive enough. If you know anything about Uncle Sam, then you know they won't be outspent when it comes to the military. The Chinese military is officially known as the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, and it consists of five service branches the ground force or army, the navy, the air force, the rocket force which handles all kinds of ballistic, nuclear and other missiles, and the strategic support force which deals with space, cyber, electronic and political warfare. Highly trained, motivated and armed with an arsenal of deadly weapons, they are truly a formidable fighting force. However, as the world saw with the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022, having a massive army and all the shiny weapons you can ask for doesn't guarantee success. So, how does the PLA stack up against the rest of the world? What does history tell us about their level of preparedness? And how would they fare if a real war were to break out? Before we delve deeper into the current capabilities and strategies of the PLA, it's essential to take a step back in time. How did the PLA evolve into the formidable force we see today, and what historical events shaped its development? The journey begins with the PLA's inception on August 1, 1927 during the Nanchang Uprising, a landmark moment that ignited the Chinese Civil War. It was in the crucible of this war and the subsequent conflicts that followed where the PLA honed its skills and strategies. Throughout the 1930s, the Communist PLA and the Nationalist forces led by Chiang Kai-shek clashed across China in a brutal struggle, a conflict that resulted in millions of casualties. Understanding this tumultuous history is key to comprehending the PLA's current form and function. One of the most pivotal events was known as the Long March, when the communist forces primarily commanded by Mao Zedong found themselves in a difficult position, facing certain encirclement and defeat. Mao took his forces on a 5,600-mile march across China to another communist stronghold. A fraction of his forces survived the march, but it cemented Mao as a living legend among the Chinese. His leadership and bravery gave the PLA the motivation they needed to stay in the fight. In 1937, however, hostilities were mostly put on hold when Imperial Japan invaded China. The two sides officially formed the Second United Front and decided to deal with the most apparent threat, the Japanese, before resuming the fraternal bloodshed. During World War II, the PLA played a pivotal role in the Allied resistance against Japan. They had very few technological advantages, very, very few armored units, poor weaponry and no real training, but they persisted nonetheless. Chinese resistance would continually infuriate and demoralize the Japanese invaders. They employed a wide range of guerrilla tactics and were an extremely useful ally of the United States and British forces. Once World War II ended in 1945, the PLA and Kuomintang went right back to killing each other. The second phase of the Chinese Civil War ran from 1945 until 1949 and again resulted in millions of casualties and untold levels of destruction. The PLA proved they had what it took to win, however, as they won the hearts and minds of the Chinese people and proved far more capable and competent at governing than their nationalist brethren. Finally, in 1949, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists suffered defeat after defeat, lost control over the country, and retreated to Taiwan. Even though they did not admit defeat, the war was over. Mao, the Communist Party and the PLA had won, and their victory was the cornerstone in establishing the People's Republic of China. The celebrations were short-lived, however, as China joined the Cold War on the side of the Soviet Union. The skyrocketing tensions eventually erupted into incredible levels of violence again, this time against the United States and its allies. China joined the rapidly escalating Korean War on October 19, 1950, when the PLA crossed the Yalu River to support their North Korean allies. It was this force that was temporarily renamed the People's Volunteer Army. The logic being that using the word volunteer was implying a less aggressive stance on behalf of the Chinese government, meaning that the troops were there as volunteers out of a sense of duty to their Korean comrades. Not sure the rebranding made a difference to the men on the ground, whichever side they fought for. Once the Chinese forces crossed the Yalu, they swept through North Korea, pushing back UN and US forces until it came to a head at a place called Chosin Reservoir. This battle is infamous for its ferocity, horrendous weather conditions, as well as the overall resilience and bravery of the men who fought there. 
With temperatures dropping to as low as minus 38 Fahrenheit, frostbite was rampant and many men were pushed to their breaking point. The Chinese forces here had a variety of weapons and equipment. Some were left over from the Japanese and Kuomintang troops, while others were scavenged from fallen Americans or provided by their Soviet allies. This lack of continuity presented an interesting logistical challenge for their supply lines, but the PLA persisted nonetheless. Most of their weapons were small arms such as rifles, submachine guns, light machine guns, grenades, and mortars. The PLA did not have much in the way of heavy weapons such as artillery or air support, and what they did have usually came from the Soviets. The greatest resource the PLA had at this point was its manpower. During the battle, they employed rapid flanking and infiltration tactics aimed at maximizing their numerical advantage, similar to what the Soviets did during World War II. The thinking was that if you threw enough men at a numerically inferior position, eventually they would overwhelm it or the Americans would run out of ammunition and be surrounded. Accounts from the battle describe seeing wave after wave of Chinese troops attacking US and UN positions with grim determination to fight for every foot of ground. These tactics saw success but were always accompanied by staggering casualty rates. Battling against the enemy as well as the elements, the Chinese troops and their North Korean allies eventually captured a large part of the battlefield. However, they paid for it with a tremendous amount of blood, with the true winner of the battle still being debated today. Cho Sin had proven to the PLA, as well as the world, that the Chinese military was not a backwater force of ill-equipped peasants. While they may not have had the best equipment, they used what they had to deadly effect. One thing was clear, the PLA was becoming a modern military force capable of taking on the UN and the United States. The Chinese-Soviet relationship meant that the PLA would continue to receive weapons, training, and guidance from their Russian counterparts as the Cold War escalated. After the Korean War, the PLA continued its march toward modernization through a series of smaller conflicts and proxy wars. With the death of the Communist Party leader Mao Zedong in 1976, China began even more campaigns to modernize the PLA and level the playing field with the rest of the world. From 1975 to today, the PLA has undergone a tremendous change and has become one of the world's most formidable militaries, at least on paper. The two most recent examples of the PLA's combat experience illustrate how far they have come and how far they have to go. Since 1975, these two examples are the only times the PLA has seen legitimate combat, and what happened in each speaks volumes about where the PLA stands today. In 1979, China and Vietnam fought a war now known as the Sino-Vietnamese War. This dispute between neighbors started as a response to Vietnam's invasion and occupation of their neighbor Cambodia. Vietnam set out to put an end to the particularly murderous and Chinese-backed Khmer Rouge regime. The Khmer Rouge had been in power since their victory over the Cambodian government in 1975. From 1975 to 1979, the Khmer Rouge conducted widespread genocide on the Cambodian people. When the dust settled, between 1.5 to 3 million people had been murdered, which at this time was a quarter of the Cambodian population. Vietnam did not like what was going on across their western border and liked it even less when the Khmer Rouge soldiers attacked across the Vietnamese border repeatedly. This back and forth went on for a few years, but it exploded on Christmas Day, December 25, 1978, when Vietnam decided to invade Cambodia. Vietnamese forces overthrew the Khmer Rouge government in just two weeks and installed their own puppet government. Seeing as the Khmer Rouge had been backed by the Chinese, the Chinese government was very angry and vowed to retaliate. This retaliation started on February 17, 1979 and lasted for about a month. PLA forces overran the northern Vietnamese border and gained large amounts of territory quickly. The northern part of Vietnam saw heavy fighting and tremendous casualties on both sides. Most of the fighting took place in the provinces of Cao Bang, Lao Cai, and Lang Son. The Vietnamese tried to avoid direct confrontations, instead opting for what had been their bread and butter for decades, guerrilla warfare. The PLA force that they faced had not seen real combat since the early 1950s and was a little rusty. The weapons and vehicles they used were outdated or not up to the task. Their soldiers were mostly untested and green. The Vietnamese, on the other hand, had been fighting continually since World War II and had mostly modern weapons. The fighting raged until March 16, 1979, with both sides claiming victory. China claimed it had won a victory and had opened the road to Hanoi, basically saying that they could have taken the capital, but they just didn't want to. The Vietnamese forces remained as an occupying force in Cambodia and claimed that they had won by repelling the PLA forces and forcing them to withdraw. 
With thousands upon thousands dead and nothing really gained by either side, things returned to normal and nothing had really changed. For the PLA, although not much had been gained, they realized quickly that to be a competitive military in a fast-paced world, they needed to up their game and continually improve. This served as a wake-up call and ego check. From the end of the Sino-Vietnamese War in 1979 all the way until 2016, the PLA had a few engagements, but nothing of substance. The next time they saw significant combat came in 2016, when they were part of a UN peacekeeping mission in South Sudan. This conflict was the first test of the PLA's combat capabilities for the first time in four decades, and served as an indication of the combat readiness and effectiveness of the PLA. China committed combat troops to the UN for the first time in 2015, a major divergence from their long-held stance of no foreign intervention. Since 2000, China had steadily increased their military aid to the UN and in early 2015 sent 700 combat soldiers to South Sudan. The Chinese government did not undertake this mission simply out of the goodness of their heart, however, as the Chinese government has significant financial interests in Sudanese petroleum. Say what you will, but I challenge you to find any government that does things solely to help people and not for some ulterior motive. Glass houses, folks. Glass houses. In 2016, the peacekeeping soldiers of the PLA were responsible for the security of a large section of the South Sudanese capital of Juba. Due to decades of rampant violence, there were over 37,000 displaced civilians in and around the capital. The Chinese soldiers here were tasked with protecting these civilians in official UN camps. The camps themselves had very little in terms of protection against an assault by combat-hardened troops backed by artillery and tanks. These camps were more refugee camps than they were military redoubts and that mistake would be costly. Protected mainly by barbed wire fences, sand-filled HESCO boxes, wooden guard towers, and chain-link fences, the Chinese UN troops were not in a good situation. To make matters worse, two different and warring armies were converging on Juba. One army had the current president at the helm, and the other army was commanded by the former vice president. In terms of strength estimates, no one is sure of the number of government troops present but the generally accepted number of rebel troops was around 1,400. On July 8th, both armies attacked the city and the UN-run camps. To no one's surprise, the two armies observed no rules of engagement and attacked everyone they came across. A widespread campaign of looting and violence commenced, with the civilians stuck in the crossfire, looking to the UN soldiers to do the exact thing that they were there to do and what they are named for, keep the peace. The Chinese peacekeepers were completely outgunned, outnumbered, and overwhelmed. They fought as best as they could, but only really had light squad-level weapons and a handful of armored troop carriers. As a result, the Chinese troops were forced to retreat further into the camps and set up a last stand. The civilians caught up in this madness were brutally killed, tortured, and forced to endure other unspeakable horrors. In addition to this, a UN aid warehouse was raided and emptied of its food and medical supplies. This aid was being directly used to help the refugees of war and was estimated to be worth a total of $30 million and enough food to help 200,000 people for over a month. The Chinese soldiers did the best they could, fighting back against a superior force. They did successfully deter assaults into the heart of the camps and help defend the 9,000 civilians sheltering there. After three days of fighting, countless civilians, militiamen, and two Chinese soldiers were dead. The Chinese soldiers died when a rocket-propelled grenade, or RPG, hit an armored troop carrier near them. The troop carrier's armor is designed more for deflecting landmines than stopping high-explosive rockets. In the immediate aftermath, all anyone cared about was who to point the finger at for this catastrophic failure of the UN's mission. The UN released several scathing reports, claiming that the Chinese soldiers had failed to follow orders, abandoned their posts, and ultimately contributed to the failure. One analyst even went as far as to claim that Chinese soldiers are risk-averse and aren't willing to take the aggressive action necessary to win the fight. The Chinese government obviously refuted these claims, stating that the UN rules of engagement and subsequent policies regarding combat severely limited the soldiers in what they could actually achieve and the equipment they could use. They claimed that the UN kept the soldiers in a defensive posture that put them at a disadvantage. What they are saying is that the Chinese peacekeepers were not put into a position to be successful. There was also a high level of confusion here, as there was no centralized command. Chinese troops received sometimes conflicting orders from multiple officers, often from different nations. As with most arguments, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Before this, the PLA had not seen real combat since 1979, which means that any officers with combat experience would be well into their 60s. 
not ideal. Training is great but can only go so far. No one knows how they will react when live rounds are flying too close for comfort, so it should not surprise anyone that the Chinese troops here tried their best but simply did not have enough field experience to make a difference. It also didn't help that they were outnumbered and outgunned. If they had their own equipment and vehicles, would it have changed the outcome? We can only speculate. Either way, it was an unmitigated disaster. What happened here was like if the Yankees played a single A-team and got blown out by 10 runs. So while this battle makes the PLA's lack of real combat experience at every level glaringly apparent, it's also a critical failure on the part of the UN to adequately arm and prepare these men for the reality of the situation. Where does the PLA stand today? As of the production of this video, the PLA has about 2 million active duty troops with another 500,000 in reserve. Of those 2 million active duty troops, around 700,000 of them are conscripts, which isn't ideal for morale. Those conscripts go out to serve on two-year enlistments. As discussed earlier, these troops are spread out across the five branches of the service, as well as with various auxiliary and police units. The PLA has a variety of weapons at its disposal. The main infantry rifles issued to its troops are the QBZ-95 and QBZ-191, which fire a 5.8 by 42 mm round. In terms of sidearms, they utilize the OSZ-92, which fires a 5.8 by 21 mm DAP-92. For a bit of a bigger bang, they have the PF-89 unguided anti-tank rocket launcher. For heavy weapons, the PLA boasts a large contingent of armor that theoretically rivals its western counterparts, the ZTZ-99A main battle tank and ZBD-04A infantry fighting vehicle are great examples of this. While they have not seen combat directly, they have all the tools necessary to be deadly. The navy of the PLA is considered one of the most, if not the most powerful navy in the world, with a battle force of 350 ships. For comparison, the US Navy has around 290 ships in its battle force. In terms of firepower, PLA Navy is extremely formidable as well, even outpacing the US Navy as per a 2016 study. The PLA Air Force is impressive as well, with 400,000 service members and 3,500 aircraft. They boast an arsenal of modern aircraft including the formidable Chengdu J-20. In terms of combat experience, not much has changed since the debacle of 2016. The only PLA officers or enlisted men with actual combat experience would be the ones who are still alive following the Sino-Vietnamese War or one of the few who were involved in the Battle of Juba in 2016. Either way, not a lot of tried and true combat wisdom can be passed down to the lower ranks, and that's not what you want when you're gearing up for war. The best the PLA can do is train as realistically as possible, so that being said, what kind of training do they receive? All members of the PLA when they initially enlist are taken through basic training, similar to almost all other militaries on the planet. After that, they continue to more specialized training. In recent years, the Chinese government and high-ranking PLA officers have acknowledged that the lower ranks, and especially the conscripts, have not been receiving enough adequate training to prepare them for the task ahead. To fix this, they have stagnated conscription cycles so that they can afford to give units more substantial training and get them as prepared as possible for their new roles. As they say, practice makes perfect and the PLA takes that one to heart. They drill relentlessly every summer, doing large-scale mock combat operations and try to get as close to the real thing as they possibly can. This includes the use of virtual reality systems, which allow the soldiers, sailors and airmen to train in realistic scenarios without risk of injury. In 2023, the PLA focused on enhancing its integrated combat and rapid response capabilities. This means that they are working on efficient communication and coordination between the different branches of the PLA as they respond to a variety of external threats. Looking toward the future, China will continue to train relentlessly as global tension continues to mount. In regard to its hostile relationship with its neighbor Taiwan, the PLA continues to conduct military exercises and training in preparation for the likely amphibious invasion. It's no secret that China wants Taiwan brought back into the fold, but how they plan to actually achieve that is anyone's guess. While the fallout from this invasion would be an international catastrophe, the results of such a move is not clear. Taiwan is preparing as well and has turned the island into a fortress with hidden aircraft hangars, surface-to-air missiles, and enough machine gun nests to make anyone think twice. The Chinese government and subsequently the PLA have an increasing interest in the resources of Africa. As the market for the resources and the energy produced here become more valuable, it will be more important than ever for Chinese interests to be protected. It's really a question of when more PLA troops will be stationed there, not if. 
So all in all, the People's Liberation Army looks great on paper. It has everything you can want in a modern military, thorough training, advanced weapons, impressive armor and ships. The one thing it lacks that's so crucial to success is combat experience. None of their enlisted men, except for some who might have been at Juba, have any experience getting shot at. For the officers, the only ones with tangible experience are well past fighting age or unlucky enough to have participated in Juba alongside their men. All the best weapons in the world aren't going to mean a thing if the soldiers using them don't have the experience to use them effectively while under fire. While the PLA could be an incredible fighting force when things heat up, all we can do now is speculate. Until the bullets start flying, there's no telling how they'll perform. So while the world holds its breath watching what will happen between China and Taiwan, the actual combat effectiveness of the PLA is going to be a topic of debate. As always, if you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know what you thought in the comments as well. Now, go and check out why China's military is a paper tiger, or click this other video instead.